Well, good morning and happy Father's Day. We're glad that you guys could make it. Uh, just a few quick announcements. Uh, church picnic is on June 25th, the following service. So uh, just a couple things regarding that. The church is going to provide the hot dogs and hamburgers. Uh, we want you to check your email uh, for the Sign Up Genius link to let us, one, uh, know how many of you are we can expect. And if there's an item that you would be able to bring to share uh, food-wise, we'd love that. And also a reminder, we're going to have some games um, including, but maybe not limited to, volleyball, kickball, and a water balloon toss. So I know my kids are probably excited about that. And just a, a quick announcement for this service. Um, kids, if you're in the treehouse ministry upstairs, we want you to stick around because we do have a Father's Day tribute. And so if you could just stay seated until we will officially release you, um, that would be pretty awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, please stand and let's praise our great God together. Father, thank you so much. Uh, for your word, the work of the spirit, the life of the believer, for your wisdom with which we may receive today with uh, joyful hearts. We're glad to praise you. We give you all glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is
the creator, maker, sustainer of all things, and we give you glory, honor, and praise. So we will shout, and we will tell, and we will be your ambassadors, because you are that good, and you are God alone, and there is none beside you. We pray that you just have your way in this place, in our hearts, in our minds, Lord God, and that you bless Doug with the words to honor you and to honor Fathers, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. A father is like none other. We reflect back on how they have been an important part of our lives. It's in the embarrassing things, like the dad jokes, and in the unsung things, like showing up. It's in the expected things, like providing for the family, and in the unexpected things, like learning to French braid. Today, we passionately celebrate these fathers and the men who took up the fatherly role where other men failed or sadly passed on to glory. You have modeled for us what real men should be. And because of you, we have a more wholesome view of our Father in heaven. Thank you, Dad.
Unfortunately, in today's society, if you if you start elevating or talking about one group of people, people naturally assume that you're trying to diminish every other group, uh, and that's not what we're doing. I think Rachel told us the importance of, of motherhood uh, back a month ago and did a great job at that. And for those of you who are single parents, who have to be both mother and father, I, I, have, I have no idea how you do that. Uh, that is just awesome. We commend you for your perseverance. But I, I want to address fathers for a little bit. Um, fellow fathers, um, we know that we have, as that, as that thing said there, we have a lot of things on our plate, a lot of roles to play. Uh, things like the provider, the protector, the teacher, um, the judge, uh, the enforcer, uh, wait till dad gets home type of things. Uh, we're the encourager, we're, we're the fixer. Uh, daddy's gonna fix it, uh, even when we can't. Uh, we may frequently feel like that the juggler with just too many balls up in the air that we don't know what to do, or I'm reminded for those old folks here that remember the Ed Sullivan show where they used to have a guy come out and spin platters on a stick, and you just spin all these platters, and he'd have to go up and down the row, keep spinning them uh, to try to keep them from not falling down. So when one platter would start to slow down, like maybe the, the platter of spending time with the wife, Okay, you got to go there and, and put that one up again. And then you see the platter of being with the kids is slowing down. You got to go over to that one. And then you got work. And then you got church. And you got other response. And it's like you're just running around spinning platters all the time, uh, trying not to help them or not to have them fall down. We have to try to balance that, that thing of earning a living and yet spending time with the family. And we all struggle with all these different roles that we have. And how can we do that? Uh, that well. That's probably our biggest challenge in life is trying to make a balance of those. And besides those roles, we have the balance or, or like walking a tightrope between two seemingly contrasting goals. So like we want to give good gifts to our kids, but we don't want them to be spoiled. Uh, we, we want them, we want to praise and encourage our kids, but we don't want them to be getting a big head and being conceited. Uh, we want them to fit in with their friends and have friends, but we don't want the world to influence them in an improper way. Uh, we want them to have a variety of experiences, and, you know, like sports, arts, music, clubs, friends. Uh, but we don't want their lives to be so chaotic and hectic, and our lives to be so chaotic and hectic, that they feel stress and are not enjoying growing up. Uh, we want them to be prudent, but we don't want them to be afraid. Uh, we want them to be willing to push outside of their comfort zone, maybe a little bit, uh, but we don't, want, we don't want them to do anything risky or dangerous. Uh, we want to protect our children from harm, okay? we don't, but we want to prepare them so that they, they can take care of themselves when they go out in the world. We can't just keep them in a bubble. Okay? We want them to live moral lives. We don't want them to sin, but we don't want them to think that their salvation or God's love or our love is in, is in any way conditional upon their behavior. Um, and so these are tight things to try to balance as we are, are doing fatherhood. It's, it's tough. We have so many roles to play. I just want to talk about one major role today, and that's the role of being the leader. Uh, fathers, like it or not, okay, we are the leaders in the household. Uh, there are two father-related statistics uh, that I saw uh, one, I haven't verified this statistic here at Oak Bend Church, but uh, it is, is a trend evidently at other churches. It, it turns out that Mother's Day is the third most attended day, church day of the year after Christmas and Easter. Mother's Day is next. Father's Day is one of the least attended Sundays. Now, there may be other reasons for that. Mother's Day occurs in the school year 
People are still around. Father's Day occurs in June. It's summertime. People are traveling. So it's, it may not be all about that. But it's interesting that evidently the kids seem to think that moms want them to be with their mom in church on Mother's Day. And maybe they don't have that same feeling about fathers for Father's Day. Uh, and that goes to the second statistic, that uh, the anecdote that I've told many of you before, but I just find it so interesting. Uh, in 1994, the Swiss did a study looking at the correlation between uh, parents going to church and their children growing up to be regular church attenders. And they had like four different categories. The one category where both parents attended church, the category where neither parent attended church, the category where the mom attended church regularly, but the dad not so much. And then the category where the dad attended church regularly and the mom not so much. And of course, the, the category where neither parent attended church, of course, their kids were less likely to grow up being regular attenders at church. But you would think of the others, you would think that both parents attending church would most likely lead to the kids growing up to attend church. But their study said that actually the situation where the father attends church regularly, even if the mom doesn't, is the one that is most likely the kids are going to end up attending church regularly. And I just find that, that amazingly that that's, uh, that that's the case. Uh, now, that was just a statistical study. Okay, we got to be careful with statistics. It doesn't address all the, it just looks at attendance. It doesn't look like other aspects of religious life. Okay, it's just attendance. And we got to be careful not to take statistics and look at correlations and think that there's a causation. So that just because you do that, that means that the kids are going to have that outcome. Uh, but the theory is, is that the children, they will look to their moms for intimacy, care, and nurture. And, and that's important. Uh, that's, that's, um, that's something that begins before the child is even born. Uh, and they have that growing up, and, and fathers cannot replace that. But as the child starts to go from being in the home and start going out and differentiating to being in the outside world, they're thinking that that's when they start looking to the father to see how, what's important. How do you address the outside world, that engagement with the world? And so they look for the father to, see, to set the example there. Uh, and so if the child discerns that the father has something that's important to them, then it will become important, more likely to become important to the child. So if both mom and dad both attend church regularly, it could be that the kids will say, oh, dad's just coming because mom's dragging him along. Uh, and that's not really important. But if dad shows up and takes the kids and goes to church, even when mom doesn't, now that sort of clicks and says, going to church must be important. Um, now, moms, please don't understand, misunderstand that, uh, that study. That does not mean that you should stay at home, uh, and, and that would be the best thing for your kids. That's not what that's, that's, not what that's saying. But it does give us dads a little bit of pause that if there is ever an occasion where maybe mom needs to miss church, maybe she's not feeling well, not so bad that dad needs to stay home also and take care of her, but she thinks it's best to stay home. Dad, take the kids with you to church. Come here and show them that that's important. Or maybe mom needs to, take, to stay home because the kids are sick. Dads, come by yourself to church. Don't just say, oh, here's an opportunity. We're skipping church today. That's, you know, I can go play golf or I can do whatever I want. No, show the kids that that's, it's important that real men go to church. Um, that uh, an example where this played a part in, in uh, my life uh, came about when my son Scott was uh, in youth group here at Oak Bend Church. He participated in the Bible quizzing program. And that's a great program. It teaches the kids to learn scripture uh, in a competitive and fun way. Uh, and we had uh, great, great coaches there. I really give shouts out to, to Jana Roop and to Diane Sturdivant. They were great coaches. Uh, but I decided that I, I think I needed to step up and volunteer as a coach for three reasons. One, I enjoy scripture and I enjoy teaching people about scripture. So that, that floated my boat. That's what that was about. 
two, at that particular stage in, in our lives, I, I wasn't having a lot of opportunity to interact with Scott. And so this gave me the opportunity to do that uh, and be there. But third, the third reason is that although Jana and Diane and the other coaches there were great coaches, they were all female. And I didn't want Scott or the other kids to think that learning about God is a, a woman thing. Uh, it's not a man thing. And so I wanted them to know that that sort of thing is important to men, too. Uh, so I became a quiz coach, and I loved every minute of it. And, and while I'm here, this might be a good time to put in another plug about the education ministry, okay, <laughs> that needs people upstairs. And as Eli and Jay has helped us to remember, uh, guys, we can do that, too. They need men up there so that they see that learning about God is important. So keep that in mind. Feel free to volunteer, okay? Uh, but this aspect of the study that goes with church attendance and the kids growing up to be church attendants, that can be extrapolated to other areas in our lives. Okay, do, do children see their father reading the Bible? Do they see him praying? Do they see him having quiet time? Uh, do they see him discussing scripture uh, with other people? Um, if, if, you want, if you want these children to think that it's important, they sort of need to see their father doing it. The, 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 the children will watch the father's interaction with the world, and that is how they will determine what's important. How is your father treating people that he interacts with? Is he treating people with kindness, with respect, politeness? Is he doing things only for people that can do things for him in return, or is he treating people well even if they can't do anything for him? Is he honest in his dealings with others? Is he generous with his money and his time? Does he control his tongue? Can I go back again to that disclaimer about, uh, you know, we, I'm not here thinking that I do it well, but this is what we should be doing. Does he control his tongue? Does he speak ill of others? Does he grumble, complain, curse? Does he listen to others? Is he open to correction? Does he say, I'm sorry, when he doesn't measure up? Does he say he's sorry, he's sorry to his wife, to his other people, to his children? Does he show his wife love? Does he show her proper respect, consideration, and understanding so that they will have an example for how to treat their future girlfriends and future wives and daughters for, will have an example for how to expect to be treated by men. Likewise, Jesus was a, a servant leader. So it, is the father demonstrating how to be a servant and a leader? Do they see us only focusing on work and, not, and only maybe enjoying our recreations that we want to do when we do have time off? Or do they see us helping out around the house? Again, go back to that disclaimer, okay? So, uh, do they see us helping out uh, or, or not? Do they see us sacrificing our time for others? Do they see us sacrificing our recreations, what we want to do in our free time, for what they want to do in their free time? Uh, so, are we leading in the areas of sacrifice and in servanthood? Now, dads, we're not going to get this right all the time, okay? None of us are. There's only one perfect father. Okay, so we aren't going to get there. That's understandable. The good news is that there's grace. Not only grace from God, but you will find that there is grace from your spouse and even grace from your kids. Especially if all you have to do is admit that you didn't do that right. Come and confess and, and then that, that will uh, allow that grace to continue. And actually, that is another role of the leadership. Is to demonstrate that mistakes, confession repentance, forgiveness, and getting up and trying again are all important. And that's what you do in life. They need to see that modeled, and we need to be the ones to model it. We need to lead in that area. Okay, they need to learn that you aren't always going to be successful in anything, and so you just keep on trying. We need to lead them by demonstrating our humility and our vulnerability. Now, let me just say one more thing then about all these things that we're supposed to be doing. It's overwhelming, okay? But we shouldn't be doing those only because we want to see our kids become better. That's not why. We need to do it because we need to be better, okay? We should be doing those things because it makes us better. And then their being better will come from that. One final quote I saw spoke to this. 
He said that as a father, I tended to focus on what I wanted my kids to be when they grew up. So I tried to teach them, mold them, encourage them, discipline. My goal should have been for me to become the man I wanted my kids to imitate. Okay, that should be our focus. And then the other things will come. Fellow fathers, we're all in this together. So let's just keep on trying to be the person we want our children to imitate. Keep trying to be more Christ-like, and then our kids will be more Christ-like. Let's, uh, let's pray. I want to pray for all of us as fathers. Heavenly Father, uh, only you are the perfect father, the perfect dad, the perfect provider, perfect protector, perfect judge, perfect teacher, perfect leader, perfect fixer. Uh, but in your wisdom, Lord, you somehow decided that you would take fallen men and put them in the role of fathers. You gave us that responsibility. So, Lord, we need your wisdom and your help to do it because we, in and of ourselves, are not able to do that. So, Lord, we come to you today admitting our weaknesses, and we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to be the fathers, the leaders that we need to be. Help us to demonstrate your love, your leadership, in all these different areas of our lives. Help us especially to model the vulnerability and the humility of being wrong, admitting, confessing it, repenting of it, asking forgiveness, and moving on. Help us pass that on to our kids. Help us to have the grace. Give us grace and help us to have grace for when we fail and we fall short. Heavenly Father, we ask that in all that we do as fathers, help us to glorify you and give you all the glories we see our kids being raised by you through us in spite of our failings. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. So appreciate Doug sharing. Uh, while some of our kids are leaving, let me ask something. Can our dads stand for just a moment? Boy, this is going to be a hard one. <laughs> the kids are itchy. All right, we're going to, I, I want to take a moment. I want to thank all of our dads that are standing. I'm a dad myself, so appreciate it. All that you do, not only here, but for your family. Uh, I want to ask, we got a couple of boys here today that's going to pass out a gift, so they're going to come and do that. And while they do, can we just give our fathers a hand this morning? <laughs> And you can feel free to set after you've got your gift. And let me go ahead and pray. I know they're gone. That's okay, though. Let's pray for our kids. We'll pray for us this morning. Father, we love you today. We thank you for how good you are to us and how gracious a father you are to us every day. Father, be with our kids this morning and those who teach them. Uh, grant them wisdom and understanding to communicate your word uh, well to them. Give our our children open hearts. And Father, give us that today too. Give us open hearts here in this room as we open your word together. Help us to hear what you say and not be just hearers, but commit to being doers of the word also. We pray we ask that in Jesus today. Amen and amen. Well, again, happy Father's Day, dads. I hope you have a great, great day. Uh, we are continuing this morning our look at the uh, book of Proverbs. It's our summer series. Um, and if you want to know where we're going to be this morning, it's like it's been uh, the last couple weeks. You can open up your bulletin. There's a section in there to take uh, sermon notes. And you will see the verses that I'm going to try to walk through today. So if you want to kind of get a head start, you can just kind of uh, mark those in your Bible and you can get there with me when, when I arrive. Uh, probably all of us have, or at least most of us, I'm going to say, have heard something called the seven deadly sins, those being pride, envy, laziness, greed, wrath, gluttony, and lust. Uh, the development of that list <clears throat> can actually be traced back uh, in Christian history to at least the fourth century. And uh, those seven were chosen because it was believed that those seven were 
uh, the central reoccurring sins that humanity struggled with in one form or another. So when you sinned, when you failed, somewhere in that sin or failure was one or more of those particular sins. Now, some, and I, I can't run this down and prove it, but some believe that the development of this list actually came from the book of Proverbs itself. And if you read Proverbs, you will know that it lists a number of vices, bad behavior that it tells us to watch for, and it tells us to avoid. And if you read Proverbs, you will find that all seven of those so-called deadly sins are in the book of Proverbs. Uh, But Proverbs is not just about vices. Uh, Proverbs is also very much about virtues, good behavior that reflects a high moral standard that is reflective of God's heart and ways. And that's really what Proverbs tries to move all of us toward. Now, there are a number of virtues mentioned in Proverbs. I've counted at least 12, but today I want to just look at four. And I've chosen these four because they're probably the most often mentioned by far and highlighted by far in the book of Proverbs and in other parts of the Bible as well. So as we work our way through these virtues this morning, this is a great opportunity for you and me uh, to evaluate or better yet to allow the Holy Spirit to evaluate our lives in light of them. And also, uh, they do have a special, somewhat special connection to us who are dads or fathers this morning. And so, um, I think they're a perfect fit for Father's Day. And I'm going to try to show you that connection as we get toward the end of today's message. So, we're going to think about four virtues from Proverbs. And here is the first this morning. It is the virtue of humility. Uh, Augustine, a well-known defender of the faith and church from the 4th century, was once asked if he could explain the ways of God and the central virtue of the Christian life. And to that, this is what he replied, and I think we have it here to put up. This is what he said. He said, if you should ask me uh, what are the ways of God, I would tell you the first is humility, the second, humility, And the third is humility. Not that there are no other precepts to give, but if humility does not proceed out of all that we do, our efforts are fruitless. Well, Augustine was certainly right to put a very strong emphasis on the virtue of humility because the Bible as a whole does, and Proverbs as a book stresses humility over and over and over. Maybe the kind of touchstone verse for humility in Proverbs is Proverbs 18, 12. It says, before a downfall, the heart is haughty or it's proud, but humility comes before honor. It's just a reminder. Listen, a sure means of a fall in your walk, in your life, is just go ahead and keep walking in pride, walk in self-exaltation, be unwilling to admit you're ever wrong, don't take any advice. That is a surefire way to know that eventually you're going to fall. Humility, Proverbs says, is the means that God gives to protect you. It's the means that God gives to allow you to rise through life, help you along, lift you up to a better place as you're willing to recognize, I am wrong sometimes. I need to admit need, and I need help, and I take advice from others. By the way, what's true in human relationships is just as true for everyday life in your relationship with God. Uh, Proverbs 3, verse 34 says, He, speaking of God, mocks proud mockers, but He shows favor, or that's where we get our word grace from. He shows grace to the humble and oppressed. Listen this morning. Only through humility, only if you humble yourself, will you experience God's grace. 
Other than that, the pipeline of God's grace to you will be severely shut down. Humility attracts God. Pride repels God. And the way God works his economy, it's not the way the economy in the world works. The way the economy in the world works is push yourself, exalt yourself, make much of yourself. In God's economy, humility is your way up and pride is your way down. By the way, James, which is the Proverbs of the New Testament, says the very same thing. He must have read the book of Proverbs because he writes, humble yourself before God's mighty hand and he will exalt you. So in God's world, humility is a big thing and pride is a killer. By the way, a means of helping us with humility is mentioned in Proverbs. In Proverbs 22 verse 4, it says humility is the fear of the Lord. In other words, a humble person fears God, and the wages of that are riches and honor and life. To fear the Lord, and we said this last week, was to care about and pursue and take on God's perspective of things. If you fear God, you will care about what God cares about things in your life. One of the perspectives we desperately need to have for our lives is this one, and that is that everything you are and everything that you have comes from God. Yes, you do apply yourself. Yes, you do work hard. Yes, you use your mind and your talents. And yes, it's okay to achieve success and do well. And some of you, that's where you're at today. You've achieved success, you're doing well, and for some of you, that's what's going to be in your life in the days to come. But what you need to remember is all of it, and I do mean all of it, goes back to God. Because without God, you don't have life. He gives you the abilities, and he gives you the opportunities. We will stay a far more humble people If we keep in mind all that I am and all that I have ultimately comes from God himself. And by the way, while it's not mentioned in Proverbs, I'm speaking about Jesus. You will not find his name anywhere in Proverbs. He is the pinnacle of wisdom. By the way, all the Bible points to Jesus. He is the pinnacle of wisdom. He is the way of life which Proverbs actually talks about. And the example of Jesus is one of humility. He served others. He washed feet. He died on a cross. You cannot get much humbler than that. His life is one big reel of humility lived out. And that is the life that he patterns for those who are going to say, I'm going to follow him. Listen, life in the kingdom of God is upside down. Okay, so if you want to gain, you've got to give. If you really want to live, you've got to die. And if you want to be great, you've got to come down. That's the way it works in God's kingdom. I know that's not the way it works in the world, but we've got to decide which kingdom is most valuable to me. Jesus said, the one who wants to be the greatest must be the least of all of you. He must be a servant. The life that Proverbs extols and that Jesus' life demonstrates is a life that is downward in self-exaltation. It is a very humble life. So there's one of our virtues this morning. Here's a second virtue that Proverbs uh, lifts up a lot, and that is the uh, virtue of kindness. This has sometimes been referred to as 
may be the most underrated or undervalued virtue there is in Scripture. And I'll be honest, I think sometimes when, I don't know how you are, but when I look out at culture and look at how people deal with each other, I think it's become one of the most forgotten and demonstrated virtues. But again, just as Jesus is the premier example of the life Proverbs exalts, he shows that in humility, he also demonstrates that in his own life. His was a life of kindness, and his kindness showed through brightly in the way that he dealt with people. And by the way, the way that Jesus dealt particularly with people who were on the fringes of society. They were the unaccepted, the out there, the terrible, the sinner. Jesus was incredibly kind to those people. Think, just think with me for a minute. How about the woman caught in adultery in the book of John? Everybody's ready to stone her. Jesus' response to her is incredibly gracious and kind and protective. How about the tax collectors, the lepers, the morally unclean? Those were all social outcasts of the day. And yet when you read the Gospels, Jesus is interacting with these people that many of the religious people won't even touch. But he will touch them. He will speak with them. He will sit with them. And he very often greets them with kindness. By the way, Proverbs challenges us as God's people to do the exact same thing. Proverbs 14 verse 31 says, he who oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. The poor in Solomon's day and in Jesus's day were the castaway people in society. They were the pushed aside. Sometimes it was viewed that if you were poor, you were under the curse of God. But Proverbs reminds us, listen, those are the people that God takes notice of. Not the great, not the powerful, the hurting, the struggling, the poor, the outcast, the fringe people. Jesus takes notice of them, and so should we. God reminds us that we are to consider them and demonstrate to them kindness, as we really should, to every one. Just a kind word goes a long ways instead of maybe one that's more judgmental and harsh. How about a gesture of help? How about a listening ear? Sometimes just a smile makes a difference. Just an acknowledgement that you're actually there goes a long way sometimes. And listen to me this morning. You do not have to agree with someone to be kind to someone. Jesus, that was certainly the case with Jesus and us. Jesus did not wait until he agreed with us or we agreed with him to be kind to us. You know how I know that? Because Romans 2, 4 tells us that. It says, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you to repentance. Think about that for a minute. God was showing kindness to you and me in the gospel we were allowed to hear, and probably most of us heard it more than one time. God showed mercy and kindness to us in the people that he brought across our path to speak to us, to model for us the life he wanted us to take hold of. How about all the days that God has given us to live when we didn't care a rip about him, but he gave us life. He watched over us so the day would come when we could hear the gospel and our hearts would be open to it and we would embrace the kingdom. Think of all the things God has done to bring you to him. And you know what? All of that is predicated on his kindness to you. Proverbs 21, 21 says, Whoever pursues righteousness and love, that word there is kindness, finds life, prosperity, and honor. 
Listen, we, we sometimes forget there is incredible power in kindness. I think sometimes, and guys particularly, kind of the way we're made sometimes, we kind of look at kindness as a weakness or a feminine trait. And, and, you know, we're kind of rough and gruff and hard on the edges sometimes, and sometimes you have to be that way, but I'm so thankful that Jesus models kindness. And listen, if Jesus models kindness, how weak can that actually be? I don't think there's anybody more, quote, manly than Jesus, and yet kindness filled his soul, and his outreach to people. We can forget, listen, there is, a, there is a power in kindness that the Bible presents that can break through some of the toughest resistance and over time actually reach people. Seldom does uncontrolled anger and frustration and harshness help us, help others, or help the advancement of the kingdom of God. So Proverbs says, pursue humility, pursue kindness. Here's a third one this morning. It's integrity. The word from the Hebrew means to be whole, to be complete, to be clean. From the standpoint of your life and my life, it means that we are not divided in our heart. We are not divided in our principles, in our beliefs, and the outward conduct of our lives. You and I live an undivided, uncompromised life. You're not one way in private and another way in public. You do not have two, three, or four lives going on all at once. You have one life striving for consistency with what you profess to believe and what you do. Someone has said integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching because God is always watching. Yeah. Hebrews tells us that, that everything is open before the one with whom we have to do business or deal with. Now, here's the reality. Doug kind of mentioned it today. None of us does this perfectly. Um, But part of integrity... Part of integrity is not about perfection. It's about also admitting when we haven't made that good connection between what I say I believe and how I've actually lived. And what I do is I deal with that, I confess that, I admit that, and then I move in the right direction. Uh, Moms and dads, and I include myself today, We will help the cause of Christ, and we will help the faith that we want our kids to accept if we will do this with our lives, have a life of integrity. Nothing will kill the cause of Christ faster in a young soul, or for that matter, in the world, than just a lack of integrity. I say this, but I really don't believe it because my life doesn't show it. Or when I'm trying to live a life of integrity and I mess up, I won't admit it. I won't say I'm sorry. I won't say I blew it. We need to be able to do that. Proverbs 10 verse 9 says, The man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes a crooked path will be found out. There is safety. There is a peace in integrity when you can lay your head down at night and know I don't have to worry about anything coming out. I don't, want to have, I don't have to worry what somebody's going to see on my phone, my computer, what somebody's going to see me in the office because I, I, I've, I've got integrity. There's a peace in that. Proverbs 11.3 says, The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. It's just a reminder, none of us can sustain a divided life indefinitely without eventually it catching up with us. Proverbs 20, verse 7, the righteous lead a blameless life. That's the life of integrity, not perfection, integrity. Blessed are their children after them. 
Okay, parents, just again, coming from another parent, um, if you want to give your kids something, and we all do, make sure you give them a life of integrity. Because you're going to give them a faith worth considering, a life that they can emulate, and you're going to give them a life that they can rejoice in after you're long gone. One of the best gifts my dad, and yes, I'm going to talk about my dad for a Father's Day. My dad has passed on. Um, I was blessed to have an incredible dad. My dad wasn't the richest. There were things we didn't always get to do or do, but we got to do a lot. Um, but the one thing my dad left me is he left me a lack of integrity. I have never had to worry meeting somebody and they say, oh, by the way, you're dad. There's never been a secret. That's the best gift he could ever give me. And he gave me a life to follow. Don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be committed to closing the gap that we all have in our lives between what I profess and how I really live. We always need to be working to narrow that down. Last one this morning, honesty. Simply put, God's a God of truth, and truth is what God wants from us. To believe truth, act in truth, speak truth. Proverbs 12, says, The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. Want to get on the bad side of God? Just lie a lot. God is not into lying. If you don't think it's serious, go to the end of the Bible, the book of Proverbs, and it says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. God's a pretty big deal about lying. Proverbs 24, 26, an honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. And by the way, that's not a romantic kiss he's talking about there. Okay, It's a totally different thing. In ancient times, and we see this in both the Old Testament and the New, uh, they would greet each other with a kiss. This is why Peter says in his, his epistle, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, we don't do that today. Mostly we don't do that today. We usually shake hands. That's our way of greeting. You can go to some parts of the world today, and men or women will greet each other with a kiss on the cheek. It's just a sign of friendship, of caring. What he says is, look, somebody who speaks to you the truth, hopefully in humility and kindness, Listen, that is an act of friendship. And if you care about other people, while again with humility and kindness, you will tell them the truth. You are not loving them and helping them when you send them down a path that's going to hurt them or destroy them. Truth can be hard, but it can also be an incredible gift and handled in the right way. So God intends us to be honest. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this message that the virtues today had a special connection to fathers, and they most certainly do. I want to show you that connection. Paul makes it over in the book of 1 Thessalonians. We've got the verse to put up here in chapter uh, 2. What Paul is doing is Paul is describing his ministry among the uh, believers at a place called Thessalonica. He's describing how he lived among them, and notice how he describes himself in verses 10 through 12 of chapter 2. He says, you are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Paul says, I dealt with you like a father deals with his children. Paul is thinking in terms of how a dad would treat his children. He says, that's how I treat you. By the way, that's why one of the standards in uh, the book of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 for elders and pastors is how you treat your family because it says something about how you'll treat the church and what he says is look here's how fathers should treat their child what does that look like oh my gosh look at what it looks like what we talked about today look at verse 10 paul says you are witnesses so is god how holy righteous and blameless we were among you that's integrity What he says is, look, we didn't tell you to do something that we don't do. We didn't tell you how to live, but we went out and lived any way we wanted to. Paul said, the things that we taught you, 
are the things we're trying to work in our own life. And you know that because you were around us. He says in verse 12, he says, we were encouraging. <clears throat> the word there in the Greek is the word parakletos. It's, it's the word used for the Holy Spirit. It's the ideal of coming down or coming alongside. It's not the ideal of being out in front. It's just being right up next to and helping someone. It's a word about humility. Paul, here's Paul, the great Paul who has had experiences with God that these people have never had, and you and I have never had. And yet Paul says, when I came to you, you know what? I didn't get way out in front of you and say, hey, catch up. Get with it, man. He says, I came down, and I came right up next to you, and I walked with you, and I humbled myself, and I came to where you are. By the way, um, we would do well to do that with our kids. Our kids can't always come up to where we're at. They're not where we're at. Sometimes we need to go down to where they're at and kind of bring them along with us. He says we were comforting. That's the opposite of being harsh and angry and frustrated. It's just Paul says, I didn't rip you to shreds. Could he? Oh, he could have. Things he could have said about how bad they were. And, but Paul says, I didn't. Paul says, you know, I, I was kind to you. I... I encouraged you. I, I spoke in a more gentle tone to you. Just, just worth thinking because, look, I don't know how it is with some of you dads, but um, I come from a long clan that tends to be high-tempered, uh, and I have to really watch my mouth and, and my, my demeanor sometimes. So this one, I don't know how it is for you. This is a battle for me. I have to really work at this. I wish I could say I've done it perfectly. I haven't. Sometimes I've said some harsh words to my kids or my wife. I wish I hadn't have, but I'm working on it. This is just a reminder, really, as fathers, we're to be kind. And then he says, I urged you. What? Live worthy of God. Man, live for God with all your heart. That word there means to speak correction, to point the way. Paul was just honest with them. This is what you need to do. This is how you need to live. We hear a lot today about what a man should be. There's books coming out all the time, men's conferences. I've read a few of them, been to a few of them. I'm not saying they're all bad. Some of them I don't think are worth much, but that's not all of them. But can, maybe today I can save you the price of a book or the price of a conference. Here it is. Dad, if you want to know what to shoot for, if the man standing in the pulpit as a dad wants to know what to shoot for, right here it is. Integrity, humility, kindness, and honesty. That's what a man is right there because that's what Jesus is, and that's the man we're to emulate. By the way, that's also what you're to have if you're a mom or a son or a daughter or a wife or a husband or a child, a follower of Jesus. So how's your pursuit of humility today? And if you are humble, you can't say so, then you won't be humble anymore. <laughs> That's the one virtue you can never say you are, sorry. But think about it. How are you today toward humility? Think about, is it more you or do you think about others? How's your kindness today? How's your integrity? How's your honesty? Four virtues. The Proverbs encourages us, calls us to bring into our life, and particularly to live out as men of God. Father, we love you this morning. We're so thankful that you are all those things to us. You are the God of incredible humility because you came down and became one of us. You are a God of incredible kindness. You could have just instantly wiped us off the map in the first sin, but you didn't. How many days and nights has your voice spoke to us, your spirit prodded us, and we've said no, 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 until one day, somehow all of that kindness broke through, and we said yes. Father, thank you that what you say you are, you are. There's no duplicity or lying with you. You speak truth. Now, Father, we're sinners. That's just the reality of it. But we want to be more like you. And 
I think I could say that as dads, we want to be good dads, godly dads. Will you help us today? Will you help us to grow in humility, grow in kindness, grow in integrity, and grow in honesty? And where we fail to know we can come and repent, we'll find forgiveness. And where we need to go and say, I'm sorry, give us the courage to do it. I bet on the other end of that, we'll find sons and daughters and wives with open hearts. Father, we love you today. Help us to be more like you. Help us to show a virtuous life. I ask that today in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please join us as we close our service today. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word Just to rest upon His promise Just to know the Savior I hope that you have a great Father's Day. Hope you get some time um, to enjoy and hopefully be with your family today. Let me pray for us this morning. Father, Lord, I want to thank you this morning. Um, I want to thank you this morning for our wives and our children. They are gifts from you. Um, Thank you for the people that you bring in our life as a means of shaping us to be more like you. So, Father, help us. Uh, particularly as dads today, just to remind what a great privilege we have and a great responsibility, and may we turn to the perfect Father for help to live the way we should and be what we should. Father, as we head out into the world this week, may we live with humility, kindness, integrity, and honesty. May we be a good testimony for the Lord Jesus and his kingdom that we hope to see spread in the hearts and lives of others. Father, be with us. We pray these things in your holy name today. Amen and amen. Have a great Sunday. Have a great